one. Hi, peeps. Welcome uh, to On the Hill uh, on this beautiful day in the Highlands, uh, joined by two uh, brilliant people, uh, without a doubt. Firstly, uh, our, um, my sparring partner, uh, Professor McClellan, here in England. Hello, Professor. Hi, how are you doing, Graham? I'm great. Um, and uh, our special guest today, who we've been uh, trying to track down for a while. It's we're really humbled you're with us, along with Molly there. Uh, Niall Downey. Hello, Niall. Hey, Graham. Thanks for that. The dogs will say hi as well. Uh, so listen, I, I understand that you've just come back from uh, New York. Uh, you've just literally uh, woken up after a long, uh, long haul flight. They, we got about thirty minutes or so to discussing to discuss something quite important for other people. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But uh, as you're new to on the hill, uh, we don't rehearse it, we don't stage it, we don't practice it. We just go for it, a bit like life. Um, but for the audience uh, who will might. Um, be taking interest in this. Can you give us a minute or two about uh, who you are? What's your background and what's what's your interests really professionally uh, in uh, in what we're doing and obviously in your support to the Resilience Trust that you've been helping us with for a while? Yeah, well, obviously my name is Niall Downey. I'm from Derry in Northern Ireland originally. I went to college in Dublin, so qualified as a doctor from Trinity College in Dublin back in 1993. I uh, went on and did my uh, surgical training in Belfast, became a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland and was heading down the route of becoming a cardiothoracic surgeon. Uh, so it was in the training program for that. But uh, in the 90s, the system had changed that uh, basically there was two types of job. There was the, the registrar or there was the training registrar, which was the one that led on to consultants post. And there was a limited number of them. So a lot of us fell between the stools. So in 1999, after 12 years of training, I was left with the decision to make that I was looking towards a dead end in surgery, unfortunately, or I could jump ship. And the following week, Arningus had a half page ad in the Sunday paper looking for cadet pilots. So I uh, took the opportunity to jump ship and applied for that. So for the last 25 years now, I've been a pilot with Arningus. So I'm currently a captain on the A330 transatlantic fleet. And in the, the background for the last 13 years, I've been uh, running Framework Health which was a um, business set up trying to bring our aviation safety approach uh, back into healthcare. And recently been expanded out beyond healthcare as well. Uh, the book came out last year, sort of exploring how the system can be applied to all sorts of industries. So since that, I have a lot of inquiries from industries outside of healthcare. So we're looking at branching out into that now, but uh, that's that's filling most of my time at the moment. So, so broadly, I have big hands now. Uh, used to be a heart surgeon, re-rolled into... Uh, commercial aviation, uh, then discovered, actually, there's some organizational challenges here, wrote a book about how things go wrong and why they go wrong, works closely with government, industry, organizations and companies now, as well as uh, younger people. Uh, my background is military pilot. The professor of psychology has also got a, uh, his own flying experience as a private pilot. So we've got three pilots here. So <laughs> look, what can go wrong? We're also white male, middle-aged men. So we've got no diversity speak, here. Speak, speak but for what, yourself, Chris. What I'm speak interested... for yourself. I, I, I'm not prepared to give into the middle-aged part yet. <laughs> so what I've got a, what I'm, you're not familiar now, but what I'm, and welcome to everyone else who's joined as well at Junior in South Africa. Hi, it's lovely to see you. Uh, this might be of interest. Obviously feel free to contribute. But I'm going to, what you're not familiar, Niall, is I usually bounce the professor with a, a question. And then we get his authentic response that's not been scripted or rehearsed. And, and we'll build on that. But I've got a psychological model. Uh, can you give us an understanding, Professor, of what you what you understand to be the Dunning-Kruger effect? Um, ah, yes. This, if I remember rightly, the Dunning-Kruger effect is uh, where one um, uh, overestimates one's competence. Is that the one? That's it. Okay, so... If in, I mean, that's very simple uh, understanding of it. It's also some people who, who mis underestimate themselves as well, depending on your levels of conscience and competence and that sort of stuff. You know, yeah. that's your uh, knowledge. But when you've got people, uh, for whatever reason, have an overestimation of their ability, and then you have another spectrum of society that's generally brigaded under what is called the imposter syndrome, what do you understand as the imposter syndrome? Uh, yes, the, the imposter syndrome is is where people don't feel as though they're that they're quite good enough to do uh, whatever role it is to carry out whichever role it is that they, they find themselves in. 
so it's a it's a, an underestimation of the, the, their own competence, even though they might be perfectly competent. Uh, the, the the two uh, phenomena uh, seem to be the opposite ends of the same uh, same continuum. Right. So here's here's the resilience trust that we set up a while ago to go upstream of some of these challenges in society and focus on uh, how young people grow in an education system that doesn't necessarily prepare them for anything useful debate. Uh, because here's, the, here's then now Captain Nile with a, an extraordinary background in uh, saving lives in the, the surgical world and then the commercial world in aviation and, and an experienced captain now and contributing to governments and organizations to prevent incident and the book that's called Oops, Why Things Go Wrong. What I'm focused on, Niall, uh, and the Resilience Trust is, this is all downstream in terms of looking at why it's gone wrong. And then we're trying to go upstream in society to try and obviously develop a younger generation somehow through talent to adjust their thinking to prevent it going wrong in the first place. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's uh, partially true. I see in aviation, uh, we think we're maybe a bit further downstream, uh, as well as trying to prevent it going wrong. We assume that it's going to go wrong anyway. Uh, so like the whole concept for us is like basically I, I narrow it down to where can this go wrong? What's plan B? So uh, it's the avoid trap mitigate idea. So we can try and avoid it going wrong, but we assume that uh, a lot of them are still going to slip through the net anyway. So then we try and trap them and sort of deal with them one step further down the line. And then finally, the ones that uh, get past that, we're in the mitigate, that we can't actually stop uh, the issue from happening, but we can uh, reduce the impact. So say if we're coming into land and I forget to put my wheels down and I realize 300 feet above the ground, uh, it's now too late to put the wheels down, but I can still put on full power and climb away and go around and come back and sort it out the second time. So that's the mitigate strategy. So the, I think we, we look that uh, no matter how hard you try and uh, avoid errors and mistakes, they're still gonna happen anyway. So we've got uh, layers of approaches for dealing with it. So it's a similar idea, but maybe it's just uh, sort of broadened out a wee bit. Or we sort of take the, the view that it's going to go wrong. So in your, that's fascinating, isn't it? In your experience then, Niall, so what you've seen in the health uh, sector, as well as the professional flying sector, and in terms of behaviours, um, would you say it, it's, it, is it systemic failures within the industry or the organisation? Or is it people failures or is it a bit of both of that? I think it's mainly systemic. Uh, a lot of the mistakes, when you actually dig into them, like you've got very competent, very good people. Like say in, in Aer Lingus, say if I make a mistake tomorrow, I can put my hand up and admit that I've made a mistake. And Aer Lingus's approach is that, well, you've been doing this for 25 years. If you were a crap pilot, you'd have done this before now. So let's find out what happened today. And we dig into the system and we see then what went wrong rather than who went wrong. Uh, in healthcare, uh, they tend to sort of use the name, blame, shame, retrain approach instead. So you're someone who's maybe been a doctor for 20 or 30 years. They make a mistake and then they get blamed uh, for whatever the, the, the outcome was rather than saying, well, why, why did you make that mistake? And when you dig into it, the healthcare especially, I mean, they're basically working in a minefield. I mean, we both know from aviation that uh, our system is structured uh, to allow for errors, uh, we put in multiple safety nets uh, to try and trap them and give us every possible chance of getting the right outcome. Uh, healthcare has kind of evolved uh, organically and different areas have evolved their own ways. So there's no uh, sort of standardization. They say with us, with Airbus or Boeing, they can standardize things worldwide. Healthcare has just sort of uh, evolved sort of in a, a local sort of uh, manner. So everybody's got its own way of doing things. So it's very hard then to spread learning. It's very hard to actually even realise there's a problem because the, the reporting systems aren't really there. The ones that are there aren't really being used properly. And uh, the learning then, if there's any at all, is usually kept very local and not spread. So I think in aviation, our, our big advantage is that uh, we have a standardised approach and we can spread it out and we can share it uh, on a, a global level. Healthcare, uh, as they say, working in a minefield, uh, their systems aren't really optimised uh, to try and help them. Uh, when they make mistakes, it's because like, the system's not good enough, but nobody ever changes the system. So the same mistakes keep happening. Now, the, one of the tables I show in my uh, presentations is if you go back into the 70s and uh, look at the number of deaths in aviation from like, human error and uh, mistakes, they say around about the time of the Tenerife disaster, there was about three, three and a half thousand deaths per year. Uh, aviation's increased about ninefold since that, so there should be about 30,000 deaths per year. 
And in reality, we're averaging less than one in commercial jet aviation. So it's less than a thousand deaths per year. So that's about a 97% improvement. Uh, the figures come back into the 70s for healthcare. So that basically in 50 years, their stats have flatlined. There's been absolutely no improvement. I think that's because they haven't really brought in a human factors approach. There's very few human factors professionals in the system. And they basically haven't really progressed. They've just kept uh, sort of doing what they're doing. I'd like to come back with that's that. True. What do you think of that, Professor? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for uh, suggesting I come back. Uh, I think Niall's absolutely right. And and, and sitting above the, the systemic uh, problems, uh, and, and Niall has uh, pinpointed it beautifully, uh, are the cultural problems. Uh, in aviation, the, the, there's a culture of let's let's make sure it doesn't happen again by understanding how it, how it took place in the first uh, the first time. Uh, in, in medicine, I'm afraid that culture of prevention isn't there. And the, the culture generally drives the systems. Um, so if, if, you, if you've got two uh, professions in which lives are, are, are completely at, uh, at stake on an ongoing basis, handling um, the risk to life in completely different ways, the, the only possible explanation is, is that they have different cultures and that the cultures drive the systems and the systems drive the behaviours. So if you want to, to solve any, any uh, issue like that, you absolutely have to look at the culture. And within that, you have to look at the understanding of culture by those who are leading the organization. So if those who are leading the organization don't understand culture, there's zero chance that they're going to be able to change the culture, to change the systems, to mitigate the risks. Uh, and and you, 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 can, you can quite easily illustrate this for yourself and, and confirm this for yourself. Uh, if, if you're watching this and you are in a healthcare uh, environment, um, the next 10 people you meet, ask them to define for you what is culture and your the answers will tell you everything you need to know a you, you you won't only get 10 responses you'll probably get 10 or 15 different definitions well if people can't even define culture there's zero chance of them managing culture to manage the systems to solve the problems so I, i'm completely with niall he's absolutely right in my opinion so can i, can I bring you up on a, on a different path as we go up this hill and try and see a, a bigger horizon here and and maybe a more complex challenge that society hasn't anticipated yet, perhaps. Here's, here we are in the early part of 2024, post-COVID, which was a global shock. And it pretty much, as, as now as a parent of young children here, it in, impacted in many different ways a younger generation uh, in terms of their continuation of their educational cycle, on the assumption the educational cycle was actually contributing anything useful anyway, debate. Now we're in a, a world post-COVID settling down where many governments are challenged financially in order to repay that debt and that cost. There seems to be a breakdown in values-based thinking across society at the leadership level for wider complex issues. But you, what we will need, uh, commercially as well as socially, we're going to need uh, creation of wealth if you follow our, our Western models. And we're going to have um, commercial needs such as, let's take, look at aviation, you know, the big partners, um, Boeing, Airbus, for example. What they're going to need and what everyone else is going to need over the coming years is they're going to need to draw upon uh, a wealth of talent. Clever people who can, just like you two, can understand these issues before they bite, if they can prevent that, but also contribute to the solution space. And so what, what that led us to determine about a year ago was um, what you two show uh, in, in, in big amounts here is uh, a natural ability of critical thinking, a will, a curiosity, a desire to learn and improve and contribute. You've both got that. And Nigel's also written, um, if you're interested, Niall, on neurodiversity and the importance of that to include rather than create the stigma that we seem to have at the moment and exclude. And I'm wondering then how you think uh, society is doing then in creating that talent pool that the world will benefit from over the next 20 years. How are we doing there, do you think? Uh, and this is a real big oops. Mm, I don't think we're doing great. I actually I have a chapter in the book looking at education. And uh, I mean, like, I think most people at this stage have seen Ken Robinson's TED talk. Uh, that was a fantastic 15 minutes or so of your time spent and uh, I agree with him I think uh, part of the problems we've been teaching and examining the wrong stuff all along 
They say, when I'm at work now, I'm working in a team, say I've got a co-pilot and eight cabin crew behind me. If anything goes wrong, uh, I'm not sorting out problems by myself. I'm uh, using their expertise and their knowledge. I can widen it out then. I can ask air traffic control for help. Uh, beyond that, we've got a, a satellite uh, phone on board, so I can actually phone back to Dublin, uh, talk to one of the engineers or the, whoever's the executive captain on call uh, for opinions and advice. So uh, everything I do is based on having a certain level of knowledge, but then being able to interact with a whole team of people and uh, work between us all to get a solution that works. Whereas in education, uh, I've got four kids. I've got two at college at the minute, uh, one doing A-levels and uh, one just below that. And uh, all their education has been based on like learning off loads of facts by themselves, uh, heading into an exam hall and giving two hours to reproduce those facts by themselves. And that's not really what we're looking for in the real world. I mean, that's a very little benefit to you in the real world. Uh, I, don't, I don't work with people who sort of uh, operate in that way. I operate with people who are used to having a certain amount of facts and then can share them and interact with other people. So I think we need to be sort of uh, teaching more about working in teams. Uh, examining more about how to work in teams and uh, f focusing on that. I mean, that's that's what we actually need in the world, not people with that knowledge, especially now. Say we come through the education system of 30, 40 years ago. Uh, back then, we didn't have Google. If I need access to information now, I can type something into my phone and I can find out all sorts of information very, very quickly. So I don't really need to carry all that information in my head anymore. It's all available in my pocket. So what we really need to do is people who can then uh, so you the, find that information, analyze it, and then do something constructive with it in a team setting. So I think that's what we need to be sort of focusing on in education. Whereas at the minute, I think we're still basically operating a model that's 30 or 40 years old. What do you think, Professor? Uh, again, I think that's totally spot on. The, uh, Einstein has a, a, a said something quite profound on the matter. He said, this is a, and I'm not going to get the quote exactly right, but I'm sure I'll get the sentiment pretty much spot on. Um, the sign of a good education is not having knowledge it's knowing where to get the knowledge. And that's exactly what Niall's suggesting here. You don't need to know the, the specific knowledge, you just need to know that the knowledge exists and, and that you can get access to it. Um, and I think one of the problems with the, the current education system is, uh, and this is a rather crass phrase, but it summarizes it quite nicely. Um, we create memory monkeys. We ask people to, to go in and, and, and rote learn whatever it is we're asking them to rote learn. And as long as they can demonstrate that they've rote learned it and produced that information in an exam, they get the grades that they want to go off and, and study whatever it is they want to, to study. Um, and of course, as we know, um, advances in, in, in any field are not made by those who use existing knowledge. It, it, advances in any field are not made by those who are good at rote learning. Advances in any field are, are, are made by individuals who think outside of the standard uh, models, who go beyond the rote, the, the, the rote learning, who pull together elements that they would that would never have been pulled together. Uh, and there's another uh, element that, again, going back to that that famous uh, talk that now re refers to um, by uh, Ken Robinson, uh, the, um, the the element of creativity. Uh, that, that's probably most uh, effective, that the thing that drives creativity is effective, most effectively is exposure to all sorts of different fields. And an individual can take knowledge from one field, techniques in a field, principles in a field, and apply them to a different field and create something that had never been created before. And, and I suspect that when, uh, when Niall was doing his training in, in aviation, he was probably doing that, uh, bringing knowledge from, uh, from medicine and, and healthcare into the aviation sector, although I suspect that the knowledge transfer would be more effective if it was, if it was the other way around. In other words, the medical field could learn more from aviation than, than the other way. Well, you're right now. That, and that's, that's why it's interesting, those two, uh, uh, those two sectors, there seems to be in the last uh, broadly 10 years, much more of a relationship to learn organically within each other. And that's where you become a, an important bridge there. That, that wouldn't have been lost on, on uh, people who understand those sorts of challenges. So we, were, we were interested in, uh, in the work that you're now doing now that you've written about and, and the oops bit, what's gone wrong. When you, when you would look at the education system that's gonna grow people, we hope, that will contribute to that solution space, if what seems to be the consensus in young people today, they're not necessarily um, 
going to contribute as best as they can through that education system when they pop out of it. What I've seen in, in my interaction with young people in Europe, not just in the UK, but through Europe, parts of America and Africa, generally is a total disenfranchisement of feeling valued at all, such that they are uh, uh, too many, as a, a majority feel, or have been made to feel, they've got nothing to contribute to, nothing. And therefore their, their expectation and their level of, of achievement themselves is significantly lowered, not just to their own disadvantage, but to a global disadvantage. Is there, is there, have you seen that or do you sense that? Yeah, and I'd agree with that. Again, I think part of the problem is that we've been training and examining the wrong stuff. Uh, possibly the people that we really need, uh, we're not even uh, coming across because their skills are different, uh, their approach is different. It doesn't uh, sort of pass muster in our current education system. So they don't get the grades, they don't get into the degrees that they could benefit and we could benefit from having them in so that we never actually come across them in the first place. So they could be the people that are falling between the cracks as you say, feel disenfranchised, feel that they've nothing to contribute, and they're probably the people who've got the most to contribute. Again, I think the what, what I try and get across is that uh, we've been very focused, uh, especially healthcare. Uh, they're very driven. They're very sort of, uh, sort of focused on the way that we do things. Uh, they haven't really been very open in, uh, for many years now for ideas coming from my side. Now, that has been starting to change in the last 10 years. Uh, see, ideas like simulation now, that's actually becoming uh, fairly mainstream in healthcare so that they're taking in ideas uh, from aviation. Like say when I was training in uh, healthcare 25, 30 years ago, uh, it was the see one, do one, teach one approach. Uh, I learned to, to open chests by sawing open chests. Uh, nowadays they've got simulation systems for learning stuff. Uh, they can do low fidelity, they can do high fidelity. Uh, you can be put in situations uh, in like a safe environment where you can make mistakes and learn from them. And the people that are watching with you uh, can learn from your mistakes. So again, that we're we're spreading the learning faster. So no, I think I agree that uh, a lot of a lot of young people nowadays are feeling that they're being left out, uh, possibly imposter syndrome, feeling that they don't really belong. When again, they're they're the people who probably belong the most. I think if they can try and sort of encourage people like, like that in, try and change like the education system, uh, try and change that people are educated in groups instead of in individuals, and that they're they're examined and their ability to interact with groups and get the best possible outcome from the information that's available. I think we can make huge progress by doing that. Uh, thanks for that, no, that's, that's it. Nigel. Last week we spoke about, we, we didn't develop this, but this weekend we've got an important part of our programme in developing everything that Niall said there as part of a flying experience for young people, free uh, uh, for, from their point of view, that we're funding. Um, you talked about sailing and the benefits that sailing brings from your experience. Where do you think, what would you say in terms of what we're talking about here, that subject matter, what does sailing do for a character? Yeah, I think it's probably uh, not, not just sailing, it would be all, all sports related to, to, to that kind of um, uh, environment where uh, one is in, in, interacting with the, with the natural world. And uh, I, I think, uh, I can't remember quite who said it was, uh, who was said this, it was something along the lines of, um, I, can't, I can't control the wind, but I can choose how I set my sails in relation to the to the wind, and I think what what people learn when they're when they're doing something like sailing, and again, I mean any outdoor sport when I use the word sailing, um, they, they they learn to adjust themselves to suit, suit the environment. Um, so when it when it's cold, um, you put on more clothing. Uh, when it's wet, you put on wet protective clothing. Um, when you're going to be going on some long distance sailing, you have to think about food. You have to think about uh, water. You have to think about sun and all the, the other factors. I think learning learning in an environment like that um, fosters in people probably covertly. It's not overtly stated um, a sense of self responsibility. They, they they get a sense that they they can control themselves in the environment they can't control the environment but they can control themselves in the environment to make the best of the environment so when these young people go on that flying adventure that, that, that you're organizing that they're going to get an opportunity to find out what effect they can have on the aircraft when they get control of the joystick when they get control of the control column uh, they're going to see what they can actually do. They're going to control the rudders. They're going to see the, uh, they're going to control the power. They're going to see what effect that has. That, so the, the, by, by giving them a, an interface with the environment, you, you, you covertly teach people how to control themselves in the environment, but not control the environment. And do you think 
when we talk about um, people's emotional responses to events in their lifetime, do you think if they had that understanding of themselves at formative years, do you think that would help their sense of response rather than reaction? Absolutely. And you, you, you make a nice distinction there, the, the, the difference between um, reacting and responding. So people who don't have control of their emotions react and they usually react in a, in a, a disempowering, self-destructive emotional way. People who have control of their emotions, who've given thought to controlling their emotions, they respond in empowering, constructive ways. Uh, and there's only a, a few thoughts between those two extremes, but the implications of those two extremes are, are diametrically opposite. You know, reacting leads you to a, a fairly negative life path. Logically, calmly, empoweringly responding leads you to a fairly positive life path. Yeah, that, that's interesting. In, in the work I've been doing, in varied work in the last, I don't know, let's say, six, seven years, primarily, uh, I've been astonished uh, as a general theme. And this isn't just UK, it's it's more uh, worldwide, actually. Certainly in, in Europe, uh, America, Africa has been my focus. Um, instead of people saying, uh, it, it's just such a negative approach to life is, I haven't got this or I can't do that and I want that. Instead of saying, what haven't I got? And I go back to the experience of Niall coming in to land, I haven't got any undercarriage. Okay, what have I got? Because when you look at it, what have I got? So you're in the creative space immediately and you, you, you automatically put yourself in the solution space rather than focus negatively in an overwhelmed state of what haven't I got? And that, that's what I think the flying world has given me, Niall, as a, as a profession, without me even knowing it. It's allowed me to think really positively about pretty much any situation is, all right, that, that, that sounds really rubbish and it feels really uncomfortable, but okay, what have I got then? What can I do? As opposed to what can't I do? Has that been your experience in heart surgery and flying then, not? Well, I see the very similar scenario was a friend of mine, Richard de Crepigny. He was the captain on the Qantas A380 flight back about, I think it was 2009, that had the, the, the major engine uh, failure overhead Singapore. Uh, one of the fan blazing broke off and uh, went through all sorts of systems and like, they lost a huge amount of systems. And I think normally like, we've got like a, a monitoring system called like, the ECAM system, so it's the Electronic Centralized Aircraft Monitoring System. Uh, we might get one or two warnings. Uh, I think Richard got something like 58 or 59 warnings. and uh, They were becoming overwhelmed by the number of things that were going wrong. And again, he then sort of sat back and thought, exactly what you just said, right, let's forget about what we've lost. Let's think, what have we left? And then was able to use what he had left and was able to land the plane safely. And there were about, I think, about 600 people on board. So there was a, an awful lot of lives saved that day. So again, I think by looking at what we have rather than what we haven't is important. Uh, it's very easy to sort of get bogged down on how hard done by we are and how much we're missing and what we should have. When we, we actually, if we sit back and think, well, we have an awful lot more than, than many other people have, like how can we actually use that and get the best out of it? And again, Nigel was talking about sports. Uh, I think that's a great analogy. And again, it's one of the things I, I cover in the book. Uh, I was a pro amateur national cyclist when I was at college. I was in the Commonwealth Games panel for Northern Ireland, but didn't, didn't make it as far as the games, unfortunately. But cycling particularly, it's an individual sport, but it's based on teams. So there's one there's one winner of the race, but uh, the winner can't get there unless he's got a good team behind him and supporting him. So it's a, an interesting com sort of concept or combination of individual sort of ability and team ability. And uh, again, big stage races like the Tour de France uh, is a, a great sort of example of it. That uh, you can, the Tour de France uh, winner can't win the race by himself. He needs a huge team behind him. Like not only just the other seven riders in the team, there's all the backup team. Uh, there's all the, the people sort of back at base. I like have Formula One would be the same. Uh, Mark Gallagher is a friend of mine in Formula One. He's been an executive there for about 35 years now. You've got the one driver in the car. You've got two cars in the team. Uh, they've got huge backups then between engineers and technicians uh, monitoring stuff uh, from the pit lane, looking at the telemetry. Uh, especially now since COVID, a lot of the team actually stay back at base. Uh, I think there's about six and based in the UK. They get live telemetry from the track uh, back at base uh, and they're clear feeding back information like as the race is live, which is then being passed back to the drivers. So you see like, uh, Max Verstappen or Lewis Hamilton winning the race, but there's a huge uh, backup structure behind that that's helping them do that. So again, back to the your idea about education. 
Uh, there's no point in being like the top gun driver if you can't interact with all the people that are helping you out. And so cooperate with them and feedback information to them. Let them process stuff that you don't really understand and come back with solutions to problems maybe you didn't even uh, understand or were aware that you have. So again, I think the, your idea of bringing in other sort of uh, ideas and other uh, industries and sort of sharing like the learning amongst like all the different bases, uh, basic and a rising tide will lift all boats. Yeah, it's lovely. This is a lovely analogy, Niall. What do you think of uh, that thinking there, Professor? How, how, how do we develop that better in not just uh, in young people, but in adults, in, in your work? That, that, that seems like an awful challenge. Yeah, there's several ways to, to, to develop it. First of all, is to create a culture when it's, in which it's uh, encouraged and acceptable and, uh, uh, and people can see that there's benefit from it uh, in doing it. Um, but if the if the culture isn't in place um, to to encourage it, I'm afraid no amount of education is going to going to change that. Um, I, I've seen organisations that have tried to introduce um, in, innovation frameworks to try to get the staff to be to be creative, and they've completely failed because the culture and systems that were in place at the same time as they were trying to uh, in, in, in encourage creativity were actually doing the exact opposite. So there was one particular uh, company I was working with. Uh, I was called in to try and analyze why they couldn't get the staff to innovate, um, even though they had as one of their values, innovation, we want to innovate. Uh, and they, they did genuinely, the board genuinely wanted to innovate. Uh, and I asked to see um, the, the personnel files. And very quickly, it emerged that the reason they weren't able to innovate was because large numbers of people had been dismissed for, and here were the phrases that kept cropping up in the personnel files, having acted beyond their authority or having acted ultra virus, a.k.a. tried an idea which didn't work and then got fired. And of course, they were, they were wondering, why can't we get people to innovate? Well, it was a cultural issue again. That was why they couldn't get people to innovate. Culture and systems will but, always stop anything you're trying to achieve if you, if you don't have them in place. That's interesting because innovation brings risk and you need to overcome fear in order to pursue that risk. That doesn't mean recklessly, it means to manage it. Uh, so it's that's why your book is so important, Niall, I think. I'll put a link to it for everyone else. It's because it gets people thinking, not just about um, preventative uh, approaches, but how we better interact and inter interrelate with other people as well as under understanding ourselves, which brings in some of the work that Niall's, that Professor's been writing on as well. So it's been great to have you and welcome back from New York. I'm still looking for my trip to Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the list. <laughs> I'll see you on the hill very soon. It's lovely to see you both. Thanks for your support. We'll keep thinking. Thanks, Graham. Thanks, Niall.